opening the conference, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Solem. And uh, first of all, I would like to announce that the whole keynote will be recorded and then uploaded to the CGE website that you can um, see it uh, repeatedly. Um, I'm pretty sure that all of you know Michael pretty well, but I would like to introduce him a little bit. Michael, after serving many years, uh, the American Association of Geographies in various positions, became a professor of geography at Texas State University. He has been principal investigator of several large scale federally funded projects supporting geography at all levels of education and has really rich publication activity. He is the co chair of the International Geographic Union's Commission on Geography Education and has twice received the Journal of Geography in Higher Education's Award for promoting excellence in teaching and learning for his research on faculty development and graduate education in geography. In his keynote, Michael will focus on school geography, achievement, and education depth, what will be of young people. So, Michael, please, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you in person. And I recognize a lot of you all on Zoom. It's nice to see you out there. Um, thank you, Martin and Merrick, for the hospitality uh, you showed already. Um, had a delicious traditional Czech lunch that included a traditional Czech beer. I won't tell you how much how delicious it was, so I don't want everyone to shut off the Zoom and I get you envious. But um, thank you for inviting me here today. It's uh, wonderful. Um, 2018 was an inauspicious year for geography education in the United States. When girls in the eighth grade went home for summer break, 78% of them did not meet standards for proficient achievement in geography. Let's go forward one slide. Okay. This image shows the expansion of Beijing, China from 1978 to 2010. Only 8% of the nation's eighth graders could correctly state a positive and a negative effect of urban growth on the quality of life for Beijing residents. Of those knowledgeable youth, Black students comprise a percentage that rounds to zero. I think I got it now. Okay. 2018 also happens to be the fourth hottest year on record for now. Parents' concerns about their children's future on a warming planet will not be assuaged by the fact that fewer eighth grade students possess geographic knowledge of how humans modify the natural environment. I suspect by now you want some good news, and there is a little. Between 1994 and 2010, there were sharp improvements in Black and Hispanic student outcomes in geography education. If the sharp performance declines between 2001 and 2014, there was a modest uptick in the geography achievement of students with disabilities and students who are classified as English language learners. Although large achievement gaps remain associated with these groups of students, any improvement in student outcomes is worth noting. We know all of this and a lot more because the National Assessment of Educational Progress has conducted nationally representative studies of what eighth grade students, students who are approximately 13 or 14 years old, what they know and can do in geography. NAEP is considered to, by many to be the gold standard of large scale educational assessment design. NAEP assessments are developed by highly experienced assessment researchers, content specialists, and teachers. 
Psychometric techniques are applied to the assessment items created for NAEP to ensure they meet scientific standards for validity and reliability. Additionally, differential item functioning procedures are used to ensure fairness by removing items that display bias, such as when students from different groups who otherwise share the same underlying level of ability have a different probability of giving a certain response. NAEP assessments are administered using a balanced incomplete block design, which means that students don't respond to all of the items prepared for the assessment. Rather, students respond to a subset of items, and item response theory procedures are used to generate multiple plausible values for each student's performance on the assessment. Each of these plausible values represents an independent estimate of a student's achievement to account for heterogeneity and measurement precision within the student sample. Now, as a norm reference assessment, NIP makes it possible to know how students perform relative to one another. But as Roger Downs noted in 2012, NIP's federal mandate quote, is restricted to reporting on the state of knowledge of American students so that Congress can develop policies. NAEP is enjoined to tell it like it is, but not to argue why particular things did or did not happen. In other words, NAEP is a description of student outcomes, but it's not an explanation of them. But NAEP also collects data that can help researchers pursue those explanations of the student outcomes that have been described. This afternoon, I'm going to highlight some of the work underway to explain student outcomes in U.S. geography education. This work will appear later this year in a special issue of the Journal of Geography. Collectively, the articles contained in this issue mark the beginning of a journey from description to explanation of geography achievement in nation schools. Invited commentaries from Joseph Stoltman and Derek Alderman place this work into historical perspective and they offer additional recommendations for how geographers should respond. I will share some of their thoughts with you this afternoon as well. I realize this is an international conference, so let me provide some additional context about the National Geography Assessment in the United States. In the early 1980s, a presidential commission released a seminal report on the status of American education. A nation at risk warned that the nation's economic competitiveness was threatened by a rising tide of mediocrity in schools. The report marked the beginning of an era of greater state and government federal governmental intervention in public education, such as through the publication and implementation of content standards and annual assessments of student outcomes. For geographers, this implied a need for a national strategy to do something about the rote memorization, factual recall, and gas tier style map work that typified geography education in school classrooms across the country. And geographers did respond. <clears throat> they responded with innovations such as the guidelines for geographic education, which summarized for teachers the five themes of geography, which you see here, location, place, human environment, interaction, movement, region, and how lessons can be built to engage students in those concepts. Other innovations included the National Geographic Society Network, Geographic Alliances, which were state-based organizations to support teacher professional development at the state level. And then there were, in 1994, the first edition of our National Geography Standards, Geography for Life. The response also included a collaboration between the National Geographic Society, National Council for Geographic Education, the U.S. Department of Education and the Council of Chief State School Officers to add geography to the NAEP assessment portfolio. And so here is the origin of the geography assessment. 
in the NIC program. It started with a proof of concept study at the high school level that assessed high school students in the nation uh, on their ability to use skills and tools of geography, know and understand concepts underlying cultural and physical geography, then apply geographical principles. Following that, following that proof of concept, the publication of the NIC geography assessment framework came in 1994, representing the desired geography content skills outcomes for students at primary and secondary levels of education, specifically the fourth, desired outcomes at the eighth, desired outcomes at the twelfth grades. The framework consists of items, assessment items that test knowledge in three content dimensions, space and place, environment and society, spatial dynamics and connections, and then you can see how those content dimensions are defined in the text there. Within those content dimensions, items measure student cognitive ability in three dimensions, knowing, understanding, and applying. So each content dimension has a mix of items that test content knowledge within those levels of cognitive ability. Okay? And so when Nick conducts an assessment study, about a year later, it issues the results in the form of what they call a nation's report card. And on the geography assessment on the y-axis, a student can potentially score between zero and 500 on the nest on the native scale. And here you see the five assessment years, the first in 1994, then 2001, 2010, 2014, 2018. And these are just the results for American eighth graders. And so each of those bubbles re represents a statistically representative sample of all eighth graders in the country. And that's the average score. 260 was the average score in 1994. 258 was the overall average score for geography in 2018, the most recent year of the assessment. There is statistically no change in outcomes from 1994 compared to the score in 2018. There's no difference between those numbers statistically. No change over 25 years. There is a 3% significant decline in achievement from 2014 to 2018, which is connoted by uh, that asterisk there. Now, with, with NAEP, as I mentioned, it's a norm relative assessment. So you can actually compare uh, how students perform relative to one another. This means you can begin to do some data disaggregation. And so here, we took those overall results for eighth graders and we had disaggregated results by race and ethnicity. The dark blue at the top represents white students at the eighth grade. The light blue, lighter blue shades at the bottom are black, Hispanic students. Okay. And so what you see here in terms of the differences is something that we refer to in the educational assessment literature as an achievement gap. In this case, differences in performance for white students relative to students of color. Now, the first necessary step then to explaining why this is happening is we have to we have to go a little further into the data. We have to conduct much deeper statistical analyses of these data sets because the data is clustered, meaning students, student, students are nested within schools. And so here, you know, in 2018, each of those bubbles represents um, all white eighth graders, all Asian eighth graders, all black or Hispanic eighth graders. Um, they go to public and private schools, big city, rural, suburban schools, schools in different parts of the country. These students have come up different socioeconomic backgrounds. But when you just do simple data disaggregation, you can't really get at the heart of what the nature of these achievement outcomes are. <clears throat> That's because just simple data disaggregation masks covariance and intercorrelations in the data set. 
Simply comparing average scores among student groups barely skims the surface of a much more complex story that the data can tell. And so now I'd like to begin to get into the complexity of that story about what is the nature of these achievement gaps that we're witnessing, and then what potentially explains them. And so the first, the first uh, study I'm going to share with you, that's the title of it there, along with uh, uh, my colleagues, Bill Corey, co-authors, and, uh, and Alex. Um, this is a descriptive analysis. And the goal of it is as follows. We want to first understand what is the variation in geography achievement at the eighth grade within schools as opposed to between schools? How is variation associated with how different groups of students perform in geography within a school as opposed to different outcomes across different types of schools? Okay. That's the first, first thing we have to understand. Then we can see what's the association between student characteristics and geography achievement? What are the gaps between student groups and how has that changed over time? And then we want to know how are school characteristics associated with geography achievement at the eighth grade? What are the gaps between student different school types? And how has that changed over time? And, this, and the statistical method that you know, we apply here is known as multi-level statistical modeling, also referred to as hierarchical linear modeling. But it's a methodology that is intended to account statistically for covariance and correlations in the data resulting in statistically independent predictions of achievement for each of the predictor variables that we put into the model. And the model is a two-level model. Level one consists of various student characteristics. Level two are the school attributes. And then the model sets as an outcome for each of the predictor variables in the model and an achievement estimate based on uh, the geography overall score expressed in theta units, which I'll explain here in a minute. And with a multi statistical uh, model, and you, you calculate random intercepts for the model and then gauge uh, relationships from there. And so the level one student level predictor variables uh, are there uh, student sex, race, ethnicity free reduced lunch eligibility, meaning um, there's a national school lunch program, so students of a particular household income could qualify for a reduced cost or free lunch. It's a measure of social economic status. Uh, English language learner, uh, students whose primary household language is not English. Um, IEP, an IEP is an individualized education plan. Students who are classified as IEP, they have some of the physical or mental uh, learning disability. Age, students who are over 13 or 14 years old at the eighth grade, because they're being held back academically. Number of books at home and parental level of parental education, these are measures of uh, social status and cultural capital. And then the school level predictors, school, different geographic regions, urbanicity, big city, suburban, rural, town, Percent of the school composition, students eligible for free reduced lunch, composition of basis of race and ethnicity, and whether schools are public or private school. All right, come back to some more what this data means and what exactly this model is producing um, for these results here in a minute. But first, the first research question what if, if you take the overall data set, what is the variation in the data that's attributable to within school differences? in outcomes versus between school differences in outcomes. And what you do here is, 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 is a method you calculate what's known as an intra-class correlation coefficient, defined as the ratio of the amount of variance due to groups relative to the total variance of the data set. When you calculate it, you're going to get a value from zero to one. ICC values that are closer to zero represent greater within group variability, closer to one, greater between group variability. And so for each of the assessment, geography assessment years, you can see pretty consistent outcome 
meaning that within school differences consistently explain most of the variance in geography achievement over that 25 year period. So the variance is more attributable to how student, different student groups perform within schools than the differences between types of schools. So within group variability matters, and I'll get into why that's significant here shortly. But now let's go to let's go to the results for the student level uh, achievement estimates. First thing I want to explain is what is meant by uh, theta units. So instead of that NAEP scale from zero to five hundred, you're expressing it in terms of a a approximate mean of zero, mean score of zero, and then trending this way one standard deviation above the mean or standard deviation below the mean score. And the first set of results I want to share are for dichotomous student variables. Okay. The output here is a regression coefficient. Okay. That the model is essentially a multi-level regression model. So the regression coefficients for the dichotomous predictor variables what these numbers mean, they represent estimated mean differences between a reference group and a group that is the focus of the predictor, holding all of the other variables in the model constant. Okay. So the, the reference category for the economist variables, female relative to male, Race and ethnicity, black and Hispanic relative to white. NLSLP, National School Lunch Program, students who are eligible for free reduced lunch relative to those who are not eligible. Students who are classified having a disability versus students who are classified as a disability. Students who are classified English language learners relative to students who are not classified English language learners. Students who are above middle age versus those who are not. Okay. Um, and I, in our, in our study, there were other student variables that had statistically significant results in a given year, but these are the predictor variables that are significant across all five years of the geography assessment. And so here we go. For female students, in 1994, the model estimates females would perform about 0.06 standard deviations lower on a geography assessment. But by 2018, that achievement gap widened to about 0.2 standard deviations lower on a geography assessment. Now, to put these numbers in context, um, Cohen, Cohen produced some guidelines for interpreting these uh, coefficient effects. Values of 0.1 represents a relatively small effect 0.25 medium effect and 0.40 and above would be considered a major, a large effect. Okay, so we want a relatively minor to a medium effect for females. Black students in 1994, the model estimates performed at 0.6 standard deviations lower. That is more or less unchanged in 2018 relative to white students. But you can see a, in 2001 and 2010, a narrowing of the achievement gap for reasons we don't have an explanation currently. But then after 2010, you see a, a widening of the gap again. Um, now, Hispanic students relative to white students improved from 0.3 standard deviations lower in uh, 1994 to approximately 0.2 standard deviations lower ever since then. Uh, for students who are eligible for a uh, free or reduced lunch, it's a similar trajectory, fairly consistent, around 2.2 standard deviations lower on the geography assessment. But the largest achievement gaps are for students with IEP, students who are classified IEP disabilities. Um, in 2001, 0.6 standard deviations lower. And that gap widened uh, closer to 0.8 standard deviations lower in 2014, with a little uptick in 2018. Similarly, students classified as English language learners showed a 
somewhat of an improvement between 1994 and 2001, but then that achievement gap declined uh, fairly markedly since 2001. Moto age didn't have too, uh, too large of an achievement gap. Students are above moto age. It's predicted that they will perform about 0.05 standard deviations lower across the entire year of the assessment. Now, there are two other variables here uh, that are ordinal variables. In this case, we're talking about levels of parental education, as well as the number of books at home. In this case, parental education would be the highest level of educational achievement of a parent from their completed high school to the next category of completed high school to complete some college, post-secondary education to finish college. And so with each categorical increase, the model is going to give you a coefficient that represents a commensurate uh, change in the standard of standard deviations. And the same with books in the home, ranging from no books to 10 to 50 to 50, 100, et cetera. And in both these cases, we see that these, these sort of socioeconomic proxy variables, cultural capital proxy variables, each had positive standard deviations associated with achievement. And again, so in 2018, the model staying for parental education with each categorical increase in the parents' uh, highest level of parents' achievement, there's going to be about a 0.15 to 0.2 percent corresponding increase, standard deviations increase on the uh, geography assessment. And you would interpret the Hispanic, I mean, excuse me, you interpret the folks in the home uh, from the same, the same way. And then finally, for school level variables, there was relatively little consistency in the outcomes at this level. We didn't find any significant effects in terms of school composition, in terms of comparing outcomes of private schools versus public schools. In 1994, the model predicted private school outcomes were 0.22 and standard deviations higher. But that changed in 2001 when the model period, it, it was 0.15 standard deviations lower. But there was never a significant outcome since then. In terms of urbanicity, this is comparing relative to uh, big city schools. Um, the only time we had significant result here was in 2018. Suburban schools performed 0.09 standard deviations higher, rural schools were 0.13 standard deviations higher. And in terms of geographic region, again, not much consistency. This is relative to schools in the Northeast of the United States. Uh, central schools 0.26 standard deviations higher than Western schools had a change in 2001, 0.16 standard deviations lower, but then 0.09 standard deviations higher in 2018. We'll talk about this a little bit. I want, I want to touch on some of the commentaries that, that appear on this issue as well. Uh, Joe Stolman discusses how this analysis underscores the need for geographers to question what happens within the nation's schools from the lens of equity. Joe writes, quote, equality in education has received considerable attention within U.S. public policy and societal norms. Within the school and classroom environments, Equality requires that all students be treated equal or the same. The issue of equity arises since not all students are the same. So equal treatment often is based on larger personal school community practices and policies applied equally to all students. Uh, Joe continues, equity is quite different from equality. Equity requires that every individual in a school has an equal chance to succeed. Equity accounts for the vast array of differences, both positive and negative, that students exhibit in schools and classrooms, and the support students thus require to reach an acceptable level of achievement among all students. So by encouraging geographers to do more than to simply document achievement gaps, Stoltman opens the door to lines of inquiry that can move the field beyond gap gazing and other forms of deficit thinking that create negative narratives about students. Joe's discussion of school equity mirrors arguments by Gonzalo Chambers, 
Gloria Lads and Billings, that achievement gaps should be framed in terms of education gaps or education debts, meaning what young people are owed that societal systems and structures prevent them from getting. What young people are owed that societal systems and structures prevent them from getting. Joe reminds us that the NAEP geography assessment was created to measure the extent American students are on track toward proficient knowledge of geography. Not the disconnected facts of trippy night at the pub, but the concepts, topics, and ways of thinking that are the markers of scientific geography. The International Geo Capabilities Project refers to this as powerful knowledge. Powerful knowledge that develops the capacity of young people to think in distinctive and specialized ways, take informed action, and pursue what they aspire to be and do in life. And so, if geography's powerful knowledge is what young people are owed, the next research challenge for geographers is to find out what is preventing so many of them from acquiring geographic knowledge at a high level of proficiency. As we've seen, those are especially girls, students of color, students who are disabled, students who are learning English. And this is where NAEP and other large scale federal data sets offer an enticing opportunity for policy relevant empirical research in geography education. Within school differences and achievement mean we need to focus especially on what is and what is not happening in classrooms to ensure equitable opportunity to learn. So now I'd like to turn to some of the preliminary work underway to identify classroom level factors associated with achievement disparities. And this is a concept from other literature in large scale international assessment, this concept of opportunity to learn. And it refers to variables such as this. NAEP collects achievement data, as we all know by now, but in addition to the achievement data, NAEP conducts background surveys with the students, teachers, and principal, school principals participating in the assessment. And it is through those background surveys that NAEP compiles very large contextual data sets about education, enabling us to compare and research relationships between achievement and the difference in context of education that characterizes students taking the achievement. Now, in the United States, the landscape of school education is incredibly diverse. Um, the curriculum has tremendous diversity in terms of content coverage, the grades in which geography is offered, if at all, as well as policies for curriculum standards and assessments. There is not a national geography education system. It's state-based and within states is often in control of local school districts. So there's tremendous diversity. Opportunity to learn can also be understood in terms of instruction. The time spent teaching geography, teaching methods, instructional materials, modalities, assessment methods. Think about all the variability associated with those types of variables. What about the teachers themselves in terms of their degree, their background, their experience, their beliefs about their students and their profession, the amount of professional development training they participate in, their demographics? And then opportunity to learn, we also can refer to school policy and school resources and school culture. You see some examples there. And so now let's take a look at some of the preliminary studies that some graduate students are working on in which they are getting into the NAEP data set and searching it for the so-called opportunity to learn variables and to find out which seem to have some kind of significant statistically significant relationship with achievement on the geography assessment. And the tool they're using is called the Native Data Explorer. This is something that's uh, publicly, uh, publicly accessible. And it just allows you to do some just exploration. And so, for example, you're looking at an output here that's comparing the average in 2018, the average scores for 
eighth graders on the environment and society content scale, comparing student scores on the basis of whether they studied geography in the sixth grade. So again, this is the eighth grade geography assessment. It's comparing scores in this content area of all students on the basis of just whether they took geography in the sixth grade. As you can see by the asterisk, those who answered yes in the dark blue, 262, has a significant difference from those who uh, answered no. So you're just comparing all eighth graders on the basis of this one variable. It's just saying, okay, there's a, there's a difference between those scores there. But again, this is just very simple data disaggregation. It's not a plausible search by any means. But I think it is still helpful to begin that initial search for factors that may be associated with different outcomes of geography education. And so I'll, I'll just summarize quickly some of the, uh, this, the uh, opportunity to learn studies that these graduate students are looking at. So each of them are, are calculating significance tests to explore relationships between different OTL categories and geography achievement. In this case, Jan and Heather are looking at teacher quality variables. Examples of that, they found higher levels of achievement are associated with teachers with more than 10 years of teaching experience, as well as teachers who participate in workshops, attend conferences, serve on curriculum committees, and conduct independent reading. So these are just some of the variables related to teacher quality that they saw to be significant. So what we want to do from there is one thing you can do to make a data set is you can calculate the extent that different groups of students have access to teachers with over 10 years of experience or who, who participate uh, regularly in different forms of professional development. And we can look at are there any uh, disparities in terms of access to teachers of those backgrounds. But what we can also do is take some of these variables, go back to that two-level model that I talked about. You add a third level, and then for each of those five assessment years, see what difference it makes in terms of the strength and magnitude of the achievement measure for that year. See the extent to which it, these variables are explaining the gaps and trends that we statistically measured for the students. Misha and Kelly took a look at curriculum content organization with that they, they have explored tool. They found higher levels of achievement with students who learned geography in the fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. Schools that offer social studies as discrete subjects, meaning a school that you can actually take a geography class as opposed to some integrated or interdisciplinary class where there's some geography content in it. Again, what we can do here is calculate differential access to schools that offer geography at earlier grades. It seems to be an important outcome for students at the eighth grade on the geography assessment. We can look into that. Students who access, who actually have access to schools that offer discrete geography courses. We'll build that into the model. And we'll also add a, lot, a layer into the two-level statistical model so we can really estimate the significance of these types of curriculum variables on student outcomes while controlling for everything else in the, in the data set. But one thing, was, one thing that I think is a limitation at the curriculum level in terms of these large-scale assessment, especially for a subject like geography, that's very horizontal, very contextual in nature, concerns with some of the content categories. So they found significantly lower levels of achievement when students claim they spent a lot of time learning about countries and cultures, natural resources, environmental issues, digital, physical maps. It doesn't really say, well, what issues were they studying exactly? What natural resources were they being asked to learn? And so here, I think there's a need to complement these high scale, high level national empirical studies with more contextual qualitative studies of curriculum that can really get into the context of what's happening in schools in terms of curriculum content coverage. So that's something that we want to do in future research. Two more categories quickly. Um, Mike and Zach look at teachers and student attitudes. They found higher levels of achievement associated with students who indicate geography as a favorite subject, students who believe geography improves their understanding of the world, teachers who are satisfied being teachers, 
teachers who discuss individual educational needs of students. And again, we're just going to do what we want to do with the other variables, build these types of attitude variables into that level to really get a pinpoint estimation of their the independent significance of each of those variables. And then USIC took a look at technology. He found higher levels of achievement associated with access to computers and digital devices at home. This is a little more of a social economic type of proxy indicator. Uh, the extent they use computers to create multimedia reports, search the internet for sources and evidence. And we'll just do the same thing, looking at differential access to these technologies at home and in school and build them into the multi-level model to get independent estimates on achievement. Now, USIC also found something that will probably frighten a lot of people that using GIS to create and use maps was associated with significantly lower levels of achievement on the geography assessment. Now, this may seem a little odd, but we also did some other studies and we found a similar pattern. The more students went on field trips, the more they did inquiry type of lessons, uh, actually the lower they performed on the geography assessment. Well, how can that be? I, mean, I thought these were like our signature pedagogies. But I want to go back to geo capabilities again. It's a future two possibility here where the goal of teaching is not for students to acquire content knowledge. But maybe it is an assessment of content knowledge, disciplinary content knowledge. What may be happening, what geo capabilities project has warned us about is the rise of these over socialized classrooms where learning to learn, the process of learning, skills development, that's the desired outcome. So while students may learn how to cooperate, they may learn how to use new software, new tools, new techniques, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But if they're not acquiring knowledge, that's something that's undesirable as argued by GA capabilities because knowledge is what is enabling students to think geographically. We don't know if that's exactly what's happening, but it's something that's reflective, I think, of some of these larger debates and discussions we're having in geography education. But we can probe into the, the data some more to find out. And so advancing knowledge of how geography achievements connected to what happens within schools carries important policy implications for improving student outcomes. Although teachers and school principals are positioned to implement educational reforms that are recommended in future research, they cannot be expected to assume responsibility for any gaps in geography achievement that happen to remain beyond their control. The reasons beyond their control. And here, as the field pursues research to gauge the extent that geography education influences achievement, it will also be important to analyze educational outcomes from a geographic perspective, the geographic inequality in education. That's because between school differences still matter, such as when school equity and policy is complicated by residential stratification, racial segregation in neighborhoods. One of the leading scholars in this area, this gentleman here, uh, Otis Johnson of Johns Hopkins University, he's pioneered a lot of quantitative techniques investigating geographic inequalities in education. We'll have him at my department later this year to help guide our work in this area. And the federal government has developed other data sets by which make it possible to connect the NAEP outcomes data, the achievement data, to other large-scale federal data sets that will help permit these quantitative geographic studies of student outcomes in relation to the geographic context of those outcomes. Almost done. I want to touch on, though, before I conclude, some uh, thoughts of Derek Alderman, who provided the other commentary. Derek was president of the AAG from 2017 to 2018. In his commentary, Derek argues inequality and in student outcomes also need to be investigated from the advantage of critical theory to qualitative research methods. He writes, quote, the literature on critical geographies of education argues for paying closer attention to schools as sites through which identities of privilege and marginality are expressed, reinforced, potentially disrupted. 
These studies also suggest that schools are key places for historically perpetuating patriarchy, white supremacy, which invariably shape student outcomes and how we should interpret and respond to the documented social disparities on the Navy, end quote. I'd like to highlight a couple other things that Derek argues is important. He writes, quote, discussions about educational equity need to occur well beyond communities specializing in school geography practice or pedagogical research per se. I regret to say that in serving two terms of, on the Council of the American Association of Geographers, including one as president, the association's governing body seldom had deep discussions about native geography or geography education at the K-12 level, end quote. Now, I, I worked on the AAG staff for 14 years directing the association's educational programs. I can confirm that the neglect spanned multiple AAG councils and presidencies. I can say that I'm proud of the things we did at the AAG over that period, but nothing I did changed anything. We did not improve student outcomes in the nation. We did nothing to foster equity in our school subject. Derek issues a time of warning as well. What happens in the eighth grade may seem a world away from many of my colleagues at colleges and universities, but in reality, it matters to all of us. There is a mutuality of scale at work in geography education that seems to be lost on more than a few university professors. A dangerous assumption that their jobs and programs in higher education are somehow separate from and not impacted by geography at the primary and secondary levels. Our field proceeds at its own peril by not actively assessing and taking seriously the state of geography education across multiple levels and spaces of learning. And just for added context there, I'd add those eighth grade gaps in geography achievement that I've shown you run concurrently with decades long underrepresentation of women, minorities, persons with disability in our field. Each year, roughly 2.5 million American students enter college, their first year of college. By the time they graduate, 0.2% of them are expected to leave with a degree in geography, 0.2%. Now, by comparison, historians publish that they, they're afraid that their field is vanishing, but history majors outnumber geography majors by five to one. To conclude, uh, as I noted earlier, geographers have a record of coming together to do big things in geography education and moments of need. Well, we now find ourselves facing another moment of need. This time, instead of a rising tide of mediocrity in schools, we have empirical research that confirms persisting and in, in, in some cases worsening inequality in US geography education. This inequality has relatively less to do with differences between public and private schools, suburban schools, outperforming big city schools, and so forth. The inequality is systematically associated with student characteristics. Students who have been and continue to be deprived unfairly of geographic knowledge are Black, Hispanic, poor, disabled, and less fluent in English. And we know that inequality is not an aberration. It is an enduring educational injustice that will require all hands on deck, all hands on deck commitment by geographers to change. And that will require further research into the native data sets because we cannot solve a problem when the reasons for the problem remain unknown or speculative. Geography is not doomed, but a lot of work needs to be done to secure the discipline status in education and society. It is unlikely that the geography discipline will grow and diversify unless geographers begin to fulfill the pedagogic rights of all young people to geography's powerful knowledge. Native researchers are poised to deliver explanations of student outcomes in US geography education. When they do, 
Charters will gain some of the empirical evidence needed for educational policy formulation and interventions to improve student outcomes in their school subjects. Bridging research and policy to foster equity in geography education may someday result in the news that the nation is truly making educational progress. And that, in a nutshell, is what geographers owe young people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, for your impressive keynote. Thank you. Uh, I think we still have 10 or 15 minutes for questions, answers, comments on this presentation about the night findings and, the, and its consequences. So, yeah. <laughs> Michael, thank you very much. I'm excited, really. Uh, you have got uh, interesting data, and I'm looking forward to, to read. Journal of Geography issue uh, in good detail. Uh, I have a question, yeah. just uh, just for me, you know, because I'm wondering, did you also conduct the item an analysis, especially in comparison uh, in relation to minority students? Yeah. Because you know, I'm, I'm quite I'm quite wondering whether they fail in the knowledge, you know, uh, knowledge, uh, let's say, dimension, or whether they perform bad or badly in all the assessment yeah. framework, you, you know? Yeah. This is my question. So, um, so no, the results so far, um, there are three content dimensions. We, we just look at what's called the composite score, which is integrating all three content dimensions. But the name data set that researchers can access uh, also has outcome variables for each of the three uh, content domains. So it is possible to do that. We haven't done that work yet, um, but we actually have, you know, the algorithm there. So we would just have to change out in the model the plausible values for the composite score, to replace it with the environment society score. We, so yes, you can look at it within the content domains if you want. We haven't done it. Thank you. Thank you. No other comments here in Prague and maybe online. You can use chat if you want, or just start talking. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. So yeah, Mary. Michael, I suppose the official uh, education policy in the United States. Is, uh, Try, I would say, to maybe socialize and unify the young generation, educate them to some uh, basic level, let's say, uh, with basic knowledge. So, is there any reaction of the state policy, the school policy, or education policy? Okay. These uh, results. Sure. The um, all these great differences. <laughs> so, America's asking, in case you put it here, is what has been the re policy response to this work? Mm -hmm. um, so we've had 25 years of data collecting geography outcomes data. Um, the only thing that's happened in terms of a response to that has been a few newspaper articles. We would publish a, a, a newsletter article in the AAG or the NCGE. Here are the latest NAEP findings. But the response has never been uh, mining a deeper analysis of the NAEP data in order to understand those outcomes. Um, and as a result, in 2019, the National Association Governing Board that oversees NAEP uh, eliminated geography from the next 10 years of the assessment cycle because there was minimal evidence Anyone was using material. And I'm not the first one to point that out. In 2010, 10, uh, 2012, Roger Downs published an article after the 2010 NAEP geography assessment report card came out. He said he had an editorial, okay, this is the third time we have an opportunity here to acquire the research data, to do some of these analyses. And he asked us, what, what will we do next? 
Well, for about 10 years later, nothing. And so you know, it's not, it's understandable why the governing board would say, well, I guess the geographers aren't using their own subject areas assessment data, it's expendable. Well, that's perfectly <laughs> reasonable decision, especially when it costs tens of millions of dollars over five assessments to actually do the study. Well, hopefully what happens now is given what we're learning, given, given the nature of what we're learning, um, it can compel, I hope, geographers to rally around work of this nature. And again, it's not just people who do art of education. You need geographers to come in and look at all that other stuff that Derek was talking about, stuff, the geographical research on yeah, neighborhood level student outcomes and all the data is out there. I think it's something the whole field can contribute to, trying to find these answers. And then maybe if we do that, and then we show that we're researching and organizing around the data, what are we learning? How can that inform policy? Then maybe we can get geography reinstated at some future point. That's where we are. <laughs> yeah, Tina. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, I, I was wondering if this is a geography problem or is this observable in all subjects or uh, is there any clue to other subjects that, that, that reverse this kind of uh, situation? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cross cutting problem in terms of disparities. Now, Unlike geography and other social studies objects, so NAEP also tests uh, U.S. history, uh, civics. There's actually a pretty robust research literature um, around those that really get into some pretty interesting, pretty opportunity to learn factors that explain differential performance in the social studies. There's NAEP in math, NAEP in science, NAEP in reading. There's a big research community out there. Well, it's you know geographers. We're getting involved now, um, but we have a lot to learn from these folks who have or experienced NAEP researchers. We, we had a symposium, virtual one, last week in which uh, research organizations who have used NAEP data uh, are pioneering these methods of linking NAEP achievement data with other federal data sets um, to look at socioeconomic questions, neighborhood level questions. And the linkage are the federal government school IDs. So the school IDs and the NAEP data set will be the same in the other data sets. You have to keep it all confidential because it's restricted data, but the linkage is what's possible. I, I mean, I didn't even know that like a few, until a few weeks ago, but I think in terms of moving forward, we got to work and learn from people who work with NAEP data in other subject areas. Uh, in terms of, but we have to do our own work too because a lot of the opportunity to learn variables are very specific to geography, okay, and the subject matter. There's some shared variables across the different assessments, but there are very specific questions about geography, pedagogy, uh, curriculum, teachers that don't appear. So that's what we're going to have to do some of our, our own stuff too. So we can learn from other subject areas, but there's a lot to learn that we have to look at ourselves in our own assessment. Sorry. I, but, but I think you're wrong that geography has disappeared from that night from the next uh, issue. So you think it's going to be back or not? Was any new any news? You know, well, the only way it's going to get back is twofold. One, we we actually have a very positive now constructive working relationship with the governing board. They know what we're doing. Um, we have a long-term research agenda coalescing, coming to being. We are bringing in other stakeholders who just like working with NAEP data and they're happy to help us out in terms of generating studies. But it's gonna take a public demonstration that the field's paying attention, like other subject organizations that pay attention. Um, and that's going to require culture change. You know, in, 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 in higher education geography, there was such a disconnect from what happens in schools in terms of what's discussed 
the policy making body of the organization, like Derek pointed out, these issues of school equity are almost never just discussed or just K-12 education in general. But I think that's that setting us up for a big problem. Uh, I don't think we can disassociate, you know, the diversity challenges we have in discipline with what's happening in our schools. Perhaps work with this nature will halt. Communicate that message and we get some actual broad-based rallying around this type of material because what ultimately matters is these kids. They deserve access to the best quality of education. We have to understand what's preventing them from getting it in order to, so we can develop appropriate policies and interventions. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Who is this voice? Hi. Uh, Hi. Can I ask you something? Thank you very much for your very nice uh, presentation. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on what we can do as geography community to follow your uh, speech, to do something in the next few years to help to realize uh, an improved geography education? What can we do very practically? Well, thank you. I think there's a lot we can do now. The first is to commit to this idea of equity. And I think what that means, and in everything that we do in terms of research and curriculum and education, I think that means we have to adopt a gender conscious, race conscious mindset uh, as we approach dark education. Um, the only example I can think of in U.S. geography education came in the late 1990s, a, a curriculum initiative called Finding a Way. It was led by Janice Monk, Ricky Sanders, other women geographers. And the purpose of that curriculum project was to uh, foster gender and racial equity in geography classrooms. And Jan Monk noted that uh, those innovations in geography education that I talked about, I started in the mid 1980s. Um, there was no evidence of any of the topics and concepts originating out of geographic scholarship on race and ethnicity in the 1970s, feminist geography. That's virtually invisible. So it makes you ask, well, whose geography is being, is being recommended for schools? And I think that, I think we have to have a conversation of that nature about the future geography curriculum. Do we not have to ask, I think what Jim Capabilities asks, we have to start with who are our students? Why is geography important for them? And understand those questions are contextual. And I think we have to develop teachers who not who are knowledgeable of geography, but they're the ones ultimately who are going to have to foster equity in their locations, in their local contexts. They have to deal with the everyday reality on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis and, and the needs of their students. Um, I think we need to return some of those early pioneering ideas of Jan Monk. In, at least in our country, uh, we don't have to wait. We, we should we should we should get started on that immediately. But it, it's just what Joe Solma says. If, if we want to find a day where we have more equal outcomes, the response isn't just thinking about students all the same, which I think is how we've been thinking about them. We have to apply the lens of equity. We are want to see. Uh, some closure or elevation of achievement across all student groups. That's the thing that you joke, I think we can do now. I think it was very motivating that you told us in your speech that uh, teachers and students who believe in what they do in geography are scoring better. So I think we have to take that and go on with it. 
Yeah, I see Clinton's question about decolonizing geography curriculum. That's actually part of the title of um, Derek Alderman's commentary. Uh, this is just, this is really just getting new attention right now. The idea of addressing historical power relationships, um, how those could be addressed and dismantled in the geography curriculum. We have uh, no research on that. But it would be, I think, it should be a priority area for research to see how those types of pedagogies uh, may foster uh, attitudes toward the subject among students of color, other marginalized students. I think there's a research need there um, moving forward. Thank you, Clint. Clinton. Okay, Michael, thank you again. Yeah, thank you.